Hi there, my name is Frank, and today we'll be taking a look at the code lab where we use Flutter and Firebase to build an app. We'll build a restaurant review app that runs on iOS, Android, and web, thanks to Flutter. The app uses Cloud Firestore to store the restaurant data and review data, and it uses Firebase authentication to secure access to that data. We will mostly be focusing on the web version of the application in this video, but we've also included instructions on making it work on iOS and Android. The Flutter app is already built, and we'll get all the code in one of the next steps. In this code lab, we'll be wiring up the app against Firebase. You'll learn how to write data to Firestore, now to read it back. You'll learn how to listen to real-time updates to the data, so that your app can immediately show the updates when any of the data changes in the database. And we'll use Firebase Authentication to identify the user without requiring them to sign in, which we can then use to secure access so that the user can only access data that they're authorized for. To get started, you need to already have a basic understanding of Firebase and Flutter. And you need to have an IDE installed. Like in this case, I have Visual Studio Code opened on the left-hand side of my screen. You need to have a Google Chrome browser, which I have on the right here, and we'll be using that to run and debug our application. You need to have a recent version of Flutter installed, and we'll be switching over to the beta channel so that we can create a web app. We'll cover that in one of the steps also. And then to interact with Firebase, we'll be using the Firebase command line interface, which we will install either through NPM or through one of the pre-built binaries. Finally, if you want to build the app for native mobile, you need an iOS simulator or an Android emulator, but we will only be using the web version in this video. Let's quickly get started by creating and setting up a Firebase project. We'll connect our Flutter code to Firebase so that we can use all of the Firebase services in our application. To do that, we first need to create a Firebase project. We'll go to firebase.google.com to get started. Now, let's move this window to the left so that we can see the site and the code lab side by side. On this website, you can read the Firebase documentation learn more about its features, or go to the Firebase console by clicking here in the top right corner. The Firebase console shows you a list of all of your Firebase projects. And as you can see, I have quite a few. We'll click the Add Project panel and enter the name for our new project. I'll call it Friendly Eats. You can see that it generates a unique ID for my project. On the next page, we can enable or disable the gathering of analytics data. And since this code lab doesn't say anything about analytics yet, we'll just disable this for now. We can always enable it later if we find a need for it. Now we tell Firebase to create our project, and it starts creating all of the services that we can use. You can see that it takes a few moments to set this up, but once it's done, we can continue to the Firebase console for our newly created project. On the left here, you see a list of all of the features that we can configure for our project. In this code lab, we'll only use the first two, authentication and database. The code lab tells us to enable anonymous authentication. So we click the authentication link in the left navigation and then go to the sign in methods tab and find the anonymous button at the bottom. We toggle the slider to enable it and then hit save. Next in the code lab, we need to enable Firestore, which we'll use to store the data. So we click on the database link, and then we click the link to create a Firestore database. We need to choose who can access our database. And since we're just getting started, we set this to test mode for now. We'll change that in step 14. Finally, we choose where our cloud database will be hosted, which we'll leave to its default of US Central. Firebase is now creating our Firestore database in the location that we selected. This may take a few moments, as the database is actually created in multiple data centers for redundancy and failover. While we are waiting, let's make a mental note that we need to get back to securing our database before we go into production. And with that done, the Firebase console will soon show our new database, and we are ready to get started getting the code for our app. 
Now let's get the starting code for our project. Let's first move the Firebase console back so that we can see Visual Studio, because that's where we're going to be working now. The starting code is stored in a project on GitHub. So we'll copy these instructions to get the code from GitHub to our local machine. In Visual Studio Code, we now open a terminal window, and I will navigate to my projects directory. I'll paste the command that we got from the code lab, and then change it to download the code over HTTPS instead of the default configuration. You may have to tweak this too, or maybe you can just run it as is. But now we can run the code and clone the code from GitHub. Let's change into the directory on our local machine. Next, we'll open the folder that we just downloaded into Visual Studio Code so that we can see its contents. I have my GitHub directory on the left here, and then all my GitHub projects on the right. So we'll open the folder and then see its content appear in the panel on the left. We will tell the Dart extension in Visual Studio Code to download the packages that the app uses. Now remember that this app contains a lot of code that was already made for us. So let's have a look at just the code that we'll be working on today. We'll open the data.dart file from the lib slash source slash model directory. This file contains the code for interacting with the database. For now, it's just a bunch of to-dos that are called from elsewhere in the application code. Next, let's open the index.html file that contains the web-specific configuration for our app. Let's keep these files open for now and first install the Firebase and Flutter command line tools. Both Flutter and Firebase come with command line tools that make it easier to use them on your local machine. Let's make sure that we have both of these installed, and that they are configured correctly for the code. The Firebase command line interface is an NPM module that we can install with this command here. But maybe your machine doesn't have NPM installed yet. And in that case, it might be easier to use a pre-built binary for your platform. You can find these binaries by searching for Firebase CLI binary and then following the link in the instructions that matches your platform, so Windows, macOS, or Linux. If you already have NPM installed, you can follow the instructions in the code lab, of course. Now, I've already got the Firebase CLI installed on my machine, so let's head over and actually find out what value we have installed by going back to the terminal window and running Firebase dash dash version. Ooh, you can see that I'm a tiny bit behind the latest version. So let's just upgrade by running the command from the instructions here. Let's check the version once more. That is great. So you may need to log into Firebase by running Firebase logon, but I've already done that before. So now we are going to associate this local directory on my machine with the Firebase project that we created in the console earlier. That way, the app will read from our database and use our security rules. And to do this, we run Firebase use dash dash add in the terminal. Now, this shows us a list of our Firebase projects to choose from. And as you can see, I have a quite long list and I actually have multiple projects called Friendly Eats. So let's quickly switch over to the Firebase console and see what the ID of our current project is. You can see it here in the address bar. So let's remember that and then select that project in the CLI and just give it a name of something like default because this is the only project we'll be using here. Now in the next step of the code lab, we'll also connect our code to this Firebase project but for now, let's first enable web support for Flutter. We'll run the command flutter channel beta to switch over to using the beta check release of Flutter. That is where the web support is available. 
And you see that we got a lot of red output, but actually there's nothing wrong. The important thing here is that it prints that we successfully switched over to the Flutter beta channel. So we'll run Flutter upgrade now, just to make sure that we have the latest version of all the uh, packages on this channel. And next we'll run Flutter config dash dash enable web to enable web support. You only need to do this once, by the way. To make sure that all of this work correctly, let's run Flutter devices to see what devices we now have available to run the application on. Huh. It looks like we have two devices here, one of which is Google Chrome. That's good because that's the one we'll be using later to run and debug our application. Now let's configure the web app to access our Firebase project too. Each application that uses Firebase needs to include some configuration data so that it can find the project on the Firebase servers. For our web application, we'll put that configuration into the index.html file. You can see here that we already have some placeholder data there right now. We're going to replace that with data from the project that we created earlier on. One thing to remember is that this all is just configuration data. These are not secrets, and you, in fact, have to put this into your application for it to be able to find the Firebase project on the servers. To get the configuration data, we need to create an application configuration in our project in Firebase console. So let's move the window to the left so that we can see everything at once. Each project in Firebase can contain the configuration data for multiple applications so that all of these apps can use the same database, for example. So let's add a web app to our project for the Flutter code that we are working on. We will give this app a name that's easy to recognize, like Web App. And then we'll register the app with our Firebase project. Cool. We now get a block of configuration data that we can use in our index.html to make it connect to our project. Let's copy this and then paste it into the index.html code. We'll also remove the initialization code for analytics since we didn't enable that earlier. Next, we need to make sure that we have the right Firebase JavaScript SDKs included in our index.html. The Flutter plugins for Firebase use these JavaScript SDKs that then in turn talk to the Firebase servers. We will copy the code from the console and place it into our index.html file. So we replace the existing snippet here to make sure we are using the latest version. We actually need two more SDKs since we're using Firestore and authentication. So we will include those SDKs too. I'm wondering if I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but let's check in the code lab where we are supposed to go. Ah, got it. Here it tells us about the SDKs too, but that's good. That means that I think we can remove some to-dos from our code here. Now at this point, We've taught our code about the Firebase project, and we've taught Firebase about our code. So I think that is pretty much what we needed to do here. So let's switch back to the console once more and complete the registration of our app with Firebase. And then let's move the window back to the right as we are ready to dive into our Dart code for the first time. In this video, we're only running our application in a web browser, but the same exact code can also run natively on both iOS and Android. If you want to run the application on those platforms, you need the development tools for that platform, and you need to do some platform-specific configuration, just like we just did for our web app. You need to add the configuration of the native mobile app to the Firebase console, so that the Firebase can then create configuration data for that application. 
For iOS, you add the bundle ID of your app, which you can find by opening the project workspace in Xcode. Based on that bundle ID and the information about the project, Firebase will then generate a Google service info.plist file for the application. This file contains the same type of information that we just added to our web app, so basic configuration information. Once we add this plist file to the project in Xcode, your iOS app can then connect to the Firebase servers. The same steps for the Android build are very similar. But here, you add the package name of the app. Firebase then generates a Google services.json file that you add to your project in Android Studio. If you do this for all three platforms, all versions of the app will be reading from and writing to the exact same database. OK, we've been doing a lot of preparation work. Now let's see if we can finally run the app for the first time. We'll be running the application locally. And for that, we we'll use the web support in the Flutter command line interface. Let's first make sure that we still have the right devices set up by running Flutter devices. Even though we just run it, just want to make sure. And yeah, that still looks correct. So next, we'll start our application by calling Flutter run and then telling it to run the Chrome device. We'll spell Chrome exactly as it says in the second field in the device list we just had. Flutter is now building our application, so it's packaging all its code into a single web app. And it then starts a special version of Chrome so that it, it can give it instructions to, for example, hot reload our code when we modify it. We'll give it a few seconds, and then you can see that we get a new browser window that's showing our application. Let's make the CodeLab window a bit smaller so that we don't block the running app and so that we can see everything side by side. Now, the application, of course, doesn't contain any data yet, as it's looking at the empty database of our newly created project. But it's a real Flutter app. For example, it supports hot reload already. So if we go to the terminal here and press R or Shift R in this window, the code hot reloads or hot restarts. But uh, yeah, as usual with Flutter, it is really, really fast. So right now, you only see it flash for a moment. I think we have everything set up and running now. So our next step is to add some restaurant data to the database. Since we just created this project and haven't added any data yet, our database is completely empty. And instead of manually adding data, we'll generate some test data for within our application code. Let's first have a look at the data model for our app. At the top level of our database, we have a collection called restaurants. Each document in this collection contains the data that our app has for a single restaurant. You can see that we have fields for the name, the city, the restaurant's category, but also some calculated data, like the number of ratings and the average rating for this restaurant. Then within each restaurant document, we have a subcollection with the ratings and reviews for that specific restaurant. So unlike in a traditional relational database model, in Firestore, the ratings are stored under the restaurant that they are for. You can see that each rating has a value called rating, a timestamp, and an optional text. And, and it has the ID and the name of the user who submitted that rating. Let's switch over to the code to start adding that data. In our data.dart file, we have a function called addRestaurants that gets a restaurant as a parameter. This function is called when we click the Add Some button in the app, which automatically generates such data. We will implement this function to add data to Firestore by copying the code from the code lab. And we'll then walk through what this code is all doing. So we first set up a reference in our code to the restaurants collection in the database. This doesn't read or write any data yet. It just makes sure that we are pointing to that collection. We then call add on this collection reference, passing in the data from the restaurant object that we were called with. And as you can see, we map each project from the restaurant object to the corresponding field in the database. Now, this is all the code we need, actually. 
So let's uh, see if we can hot reload the application and then tell it to add some data. Hmm. Nothing shown in the app yet, but that makes sense because we're not yet reading from the database. But if you look at the database tab in the console, you can see that we have a bunch of documents there now. Uh, let's make sure that those were actually created by our code and let's add some more. Huh. You can see that in the Firebase console, now some documents show up in green. These are documents that actually are being added to the database by our code right now. So that's all it takes to add data to the database. Let's move on to the next step and start displaying that data in the app. The application already has all the Flutter code that is needed to display the restaurants, but we need to add code that reads those restaurants from Firestore. This starts with a function called load all restaurants, which loads the restaurant data from Firestore that the main screen of our app then displays. So we copy paste this code from the code lab into our data.dart again, replacing the to do. Just like before, this code starts by creating a reference to the restaurants collection. We then order the restaurants by their average rating. And we then limit the query to 50 results. So those are the 50 highest rated restaurants in our database. And finally, we call snapshots on the query, which returns of a stream of query snapshot objects. Now, each query snapshot contains the entire results for the query, so up to 50 documents. But instead of returning the results only once, our code continues to monitor the database for changes. And then if there are any relevant changes, we get called again with another query snapshot with the latest restaurant data for our query. So with this single method, our app will work the same way that the console just did. It will automatically update when a new restaurant is added or when something is updated. You can read more about this in the code lab too, but we're on to the next step because we need to convert the query snapshot into a list of restaurant objects. In our data.dart file, we have a function called getRestaurantsFromQuery that takes a query snapshot with all the documents and then converts that into a list of restaurant objects, like the one we saw when we were adding data to the database. Let's actually have a quick look at what a restaurant class really looks like. So you see that this class has all the same fields that we have in our database and that it has a method called random that generates a random object. So that was called earlier. And then it has a from snapshot method that converts a document snapshot from the database into a restaurant object that our application code uses. This actually seems like the perfect helper method for our current task. So let's switch back here and then copy the code from the code lab into our app and see what it's doing. Cool. So this code loops over the documents in the query snapshot and then it maps each document snapshot to a restaurant object. So by doing this, we get a list of restaurants in the format that the rest of the apps expects. Okay. Now I see that the code lab explains a lot more about real-time listeners, but you know, it's actually much more fun to see this in action. So how about we see if we can hot reload the app again? There we are. So our app is now showing the restaurants from the database. But remember, the app is also now monitoring the database for updates to these restaurants. So if we switch over to the Firebase console, let's try this out. Let's filter and order our documents in the console to show in the same order that we get them in our application. So we'll show them with the highest rated restaurant first. Now, our first restaurant in the console is called Dinner Hype, and that's the same name that we see at the top of our app. So that means that if we now change the rating for the restaurant in the database, our app should immediately update this. Let's change it once more, just to see it again. Ooh. So you can see that Firestore's real-time listeners do for our data what Hot Reload is doing for our code. Everything updates magically when you make changes. Whew, that was an exciting step. Let's switch back to the code lab and move on to the next step. So our main screen now shows a list of restaurant data that updates in real time when we make changes to the database. 
But when you click on one of these restaurants, we want to show the data for just that restaurant. And while we already have that data, we're going to reload it here, just so that we also see some other parts of the API. We'll do the reloading by calling the get method, which we're going to use in our get restaurant function. And while on snapshot listens for updates to the data, the get method just gets the data once. OK. We'll copy the code from the code lab again and replace the to do in the data.dart file. And once again, we start by referencing the collection. But now we get a reference to the specific document for the selected restaurant. And then we call get on it to load the document. Remember, unlike on snapshot, calling get means we get the document only once and we don't keep listening for updates. We don't get a stream, but we get a future. So if we call then, we get a document snapshot with the data. And we then convert that to a restaurant object with the same helper method from before. Let's hot reload again. And then click on the dinner hyper restaurant in the app. You can now see the data for this specific restaurant here at the top. But there are no reviews for the restaurant yet. So let's actually make the add some button in this step work. There are two ways to add reviews for a restaurant in our application. First off, you can click the Add Some button to generate a bunch of reviews for this restaurant, similar to what we did for the restaurants themselves. But you can also click the Plus button to add a single review for the restaurant. Let's have a look at the data model again, just as a reminder. So remember, each restaurant has a document in our top-level restaurants collection. And then under each restaurant document, we have a sub-collection called Ratings, where we add the reviews and ratings. But remember that each restaurant also has an average rating, and that value is stored in the restaurant document itself. So when the user adds a review, we need to write a new review document, and we need to update the restaurant document, and we need to do that atomically. OK, let's switch back to step 11 and get to work on that. So we need to implement the add review function here. And we'll do that again by copying the code from the code lab. Now, there's quite a bit of code here. So let's just copy and paste it first and then figure out what it does step by step. Let's see. OK. We again start at the top here by setting up a reference to our restaurant document based on the ID of the restaurant that the user provided the review for. OK, then we tell Firestore to run a transaction, which gives us a transaction object. Now, in our transaction, we do all the data manipulation, which includes reading data that we want to modify. So we first read the restaurant document that we are going to modify the rating for. So we get back a document snapshot and once again convert that into a restaurant object just because it's easier to work with. Now we determine the new number of ratings and we calculate the new average rating by combining the existing and the new values. And we then call the update method on the transaction to update these two fields in the existing restaurant's document. Next, we create a new document in our rating subcollection for this new review. And since we call the document function here without any parameters, Firestore creates a new document with an auto-generated ID for us. We will pass in the values from the review object into the database, pretty much the same like we did with restaurants earlier. Now, this entire block of code that we have here runs as a transaction. And that means 
that Firestore checks if our restaurant was modified by someone else since we read it here. And if it was modified, it will call our transaction block and try again. So we'll read it, get the new value and try again to modify it. Only if nobody else submitted a review at the same time, will our changes be committed to the database. Firestore transactions are of the compare and set type. So we don't lock the database, but they check if there were any modifications while we were working on the data. Cool. Let's, uh, I think, reload our application again. And let's try our changes, right? Let's go back to the restaurant and add some reviews. Ooh. So you can see that the reviews show up immediately. So let's go back to the main page and maybe add some reviews for another restaurant also. Maybe Snack Palace also needs reviews. Right, that looks much better. So we've now generated ratings for our first two restaurants. And since these are the only restaurants with any reviews, they're also the highest rated restaurants. So they show up at the top of our results. I think that was it that we needed to do for this step, but let's double check in the code lab. All oh, right. Yeah, we also need to make sure that we can add our own review by clicking on the plus button. So hyper belly actually looks really yummy. So we click on the plus button and we give it a rating and a like short review. Now, since I'm giving this five stars, Hyperbelly should become our new top rated restaurants. And look at that. It's showing up there right at the top. Cool. Let's move on to the next step. The user interface of our app already has the option to filter the restaurants and to change their sort order. We can filter by the sort of food, location, and the price. We can order by rating or the number of reviews. In Firestore, you can filter data by using the WHERE method on a collection. In this snippet, we create a query that returns only dim sum restaurants. Now, you can call WHERE again on the query to filter by multiple conditions, and also then to order the results. By creating one query on top of the previous one, you can create quite complex filters. Let's see how we can apply this logic in our app. For this, we will implement the load filtered restaurants function that is called when the user applies a filter. We get a filter object passed, so let's quickly see what we have in there. Uh, this looks familiar, right? These fields match exactly the user interface that we just saw. So we'll use these values in the filter object to build the query and to retrieve the data from the database. We'll copy the code from the code lab again and replace the to-do in our application with the code. As always, we start by creating a reference to the restaurant's local collection. But note that this time we declare it as a query object. Now, query is a parent class of the collection reference, so this works fine. But it allows us to now add more conditions to our query. If the user selected the category to filter on, then we change our query to the one with the filter they selected. And if they selected the city, we filter on that too. And if they filtered on price, we create a query that includes that filter too. So in the end, we have a query that filters for up to three conditions, and we then order by the average rating or whatever the user selected to order by. Let's reload the app and see if it works. I. Uh, Love a good burger, so let's filter for those. And as you can see, our list only contains two burger restaurants. Now let's also filter for Portland so that we only see burger joints in Portland. Now, 
That leaves us with only one restaurant. But if you paid attention to the terminal, you might have noticed that the app is now suddenly generating a lot of errors. That's because we haven't defined any index yet to allow this query. Now, the query works fine because the client-side code is actually doing the querying for us. But if we want this query to scale to millions of restaurants, we need to define an index for it. Luckily, the error message contains the exact URL that we need to generate that index. So if we open this link in a browser, it takes us to the Firebase console. Hmm, that doesn't look right. Uh, let's try that again. That looks better. So we need to create an index on these fields. Now, with this index, the server can perform the same query in the same amount of time, no matter the amount of data that we have in our database. But uh, instead of adding an index in the console for every combination of fields, let's see if the code lab has an easier way for us to define the indexes for the entire database in one go. We can also define the indexes for our database in a file called firestore.indexes.json. And since we need quite a lot of indexes, let's look up that file in our code base. So this file defines a list of indexes. And then for each index, it says what collections it exists in and what fields are part of the index. And as you can see, we have quite a number of indexes here, all on different combinations of fields so that we can order and filter on those fields. To apply these indexes to our project, we're going to deploy them using the Firebase command line interface that we set up before. So we need to run this command apparently. So let's copy it. And all right, our first terminal is running the Flutter CLI to host our app. So we'll open a second terminal to run this command. So the Firebase deploy dash dash only Firestore colon indexes command tells the CLI to only deploy the Firestore index file and nothing else. OK, looks like the command is successful. So let's go to the Firestore console and to see what's happened. We go to the indexes, tap. You can see that Firebase Store is creating all the indexes that were in our file. Now, depending on the amount of data in your database, this may take some time. So let's just give it a few moments and see if they complete quickly today. OK, I'm out of patience, actually. Let's switch back to our console that's running the Flutter tools. And then let's go back to the app and clear the location query. Hmm. Looks like I'm still getting the same error. So that makes sense because the indexes are still being created. So, Well, we're going to have to move on for now. But when you do this yourself, just give it a few minutes to create the indexes and then try again. Once you stop getting the error message, you can be certain that Firestore can perform these queries at any scale, no matter how many restaurants or views you add to the app. You remember that we set our database to be completely accessible to everyone when we created it? And we said then that we would fix it later. Well, now is the time to address that. And I think that's just in time too, because as I can see in the next step, we'll publish our app to make it accessible to external users. So we want to make sure that users can only access the data that they're authorized to. To do that, we'll be using these security rules, which are automatically enforced on the Firebase servers whenever someone accesses the data. These rules are in a proprietary language but it looks quite similar to JavaScript. The first three lines are always the same, but this line here tells us that we're setting the access rules for our restaurant documents. Here we are allowing anyone who is signed in to create and read these documents. The request.auth variable is automatically set by Firebase Authentication, and it can't be faked by anyone else. Next, we say that any signed-in user can modify the document, but that they can never change the restaurant's name. And then finally, we don't allow anyone to delete any restaurant document, ever. 
Next up, we also need to set the rules for our rating sub collection. Remember, that is nested under each restaurant document. So we set up the rules by nesting them under the rules for the restaurants. Once again, anyone who is signed in can read any ratings data, which makes sense because we're showing these ratings on our app. So we want to make sure you can read them. A user can create a ratings document if they are signed in and if the user ID from authentication is also present in the user ID field of the document. And since the request.auth is auto-populated and can't be spoofed, this means that the user can only post ratings on their, their own account and not on anyone else's. Finally, nobody can ever update or delete ratings in our application. So we've defined access rules for all of our data. And there's definitely things that we could improve here, but these rules are already much more secure than what we started with. So uh, let's copy them and then go over to the Firestore console to deploy them. Okay, so we switch over to the rules tab and in there we replace the rules that we've used so far with these more secure rules that we created. So now we can publish the rules and then within moments they will take effect and users can only access their data as defined by these rules. As you can probably imagine, defining security rules is a crucial part of creating a secure application that your users can trust. So be sure to study these rules and to practice writing your own. Let's switch back to the code lab. In here, you can see that we can also deploy the rules from a file by using the Firebase CLI, just like we could do with the Firestore indexes earlier. And here's a handy link to learn more about security rules. But for now, it's time to make our application available to the first users. So far, when we were accessing the application, we were accessing the web server that's built into the Flutter command line tools. You can see that from the local host that it says here in the address bar of Chrome. Hmm, let's quickly clear our filters so that we can see all restaurants again. And then in this step, we are going to deploy our app to Firebase Hosting so that anyone can access it. First up, that means that we'll need to build a web version of the application. We'll copy the command from the code lab and then switch over to the second terminal in Visual Studio Code. We will paste the command and you can see that the Flutter tools are now again gathering all the source code and resources for our application, but now they're bundling them together for a production deployment to Firebase Hosting. This may take a few moments, so let's close some files and see what else we need to do. Right. Next up, we're going to take the bundle of files that Flutter is generating and deploy that to Firebase Hosting with the Firebase command line tools. We'll paste the command. And now you see that, hmm, once again, it's actually rebuilding the application, but now for all platforms, for iOS, Android, and web. This sort of is great because we don't actually have to run Flutter build as a separate step next time, but it means that now we just have to wait a bit longer. But next time we can just run the Firebase deploy command that will build and deploy the Flutter web application. Now this is done. Then you can see that Firebase is packing up the files itself and it's then deploying them to the hosting servers and to the CDN across the world. This goes very quickly. So we get a URL that anyone can access and can use to use our application. Let's see if it works. We can see that this URL now opens in my regular Chrome browser because the app is no longer connected to the Flutter developer tools. Look at that. We have the same restaurant data as before, but now on a URL that we can share with family, friends, and all our future users. And keep in mind, everything that we built before still works. So I can still add a review for Place Pop. I've heard some good stories about this place, so let's give it another five-star rating. So remember, this URL is accessible to everyone. And in fact, it's hosted on the CDN of Firebase for fast access everywhere in the world. 
Let's switch back to the code lab and let's sort of do a recap of everything we've done in the past 45 minutes. Congratulations, you've made it to the end of the code lab. And from start to finish, we've built a complete restaurant review app with Flutter and Firebase. And the app can be run on iOS, Android, and as a web app, as we did here. We've learned about Firestore and how to access it from our Flutter code to add data, read data, and to perform queries to show only a subset of that data. We've also performed a complex update where we added the review and then updated the restaurant atomically in a single transaction. If you got stuck on one of the steps, have a look at the code in the done branch in the GitHub repo. And if you want to learn more about Flutter or Firebase or how to use them together to build beautiful serverless cross-platform applications, follow the other links in this page. We've even included some advanced exercises here, just in case you're ready for a next challenge. Now, I want to thank you for taking this code lab together with me. And if you want to find more content, please subscribe to the Firebase channel on YouTube or have a look at one of these other code labs.